appearance. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, which being translated into the vernacular of the day is he was well-built and good-looking. <laughs> Joseph was a man who made women turn their heads. And the Bible tells us that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, took notice of him and tried to seduce him. And it's an illustration of the fact that there are some things the Bible tells us we are never to fight. Did you know that the Bible tells us that we're to flee immorality? We're to run away from it. I've told kids ever since I've been teaching this passage to young people that the best equipment you can ever get for overcoming sexual temptation is the best pair of Adidas money will buy. <laughs> Here was a woman physically infatuated with her husband's handsome, strapping young slave, and she did everything she could to lure him into immorality. But Joseph knew two things. He knew that if he slept with Potiphar's wife, it would betray the man who had invested a great deal of confidence in him, and even greater, it would be a sin against his God. And he resisted, and he refused, and when she tried to physically force him into bed, he ran out of the house, leaving his coat in her hands, because Joseph knew that he was better off without his coat than without his character. And today, all these years later, men and women, which is evident by what we seem to see on television almost every day, we face the very intensity of temptation that Joseph faced. But here's the promise we have in the New Testament. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. If we're going to be overcomers, we have to be resourceful in our dreams, resilient in our difficulties, resistant in our desires, Notice the fourth one. We have to be resolute in our disappointments. Here's the next chapter in Joseph's life. Watch this. When Joseph refused the seduction of his boss's wife, she went to her husband and accused Joseph of sexual assault. He hadn't done anything. He was innocent, but he ended up in prison. And I can only imagine, friends, how Joseph felt when day after day passed, he had been in bondage from age 17 to now nearly 30. He must have felt like giving up and resigning himself to live out his days behind bars and die in prison. But Joseph didn't give up. He never lost hope. He never went back on his dream. And you know the rest of the story, but I can't leave you hanging. I got to tell you the whole thing. The fifth principle is to be responsible in your duties. Watch what happens. One day, the king woke up, and he'd had a set of dreams the night before that troubled him greatly. And Pharaoh brings Joseph in, and he describes his dreams to Joseph, and the Lord gave Joseph the insight to interpret them. And you know the story. It was a prediction of seven years of abundant crops followed by seven years of terrible famine. And Joseph told the king to make diligent plans to store vast amounts of grain for the next seven years to withstand the ensuing years of famine. And he suggested the king select a capable leader to oversee the program. Verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this? I mean, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all of this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and over my people. You shall rule according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Once again, Joseph moved up the ladder and he got the top job all the hardship, all the disappointment, all the delays. It was all preparing Joseph to literally overnight become the second most powerful man in the world, in effect, the prime minister and governor of Egypt. Is that a story or what? But it's still not over. We have to learn to be restrained in our determinations. This is the most meaningful epic in the life of Joseph. 
I have to honestly tell you, I, I've read this story many times and preached on it two or three. I hardly ever get through it without tears. It is one of the most emotional stories in the Bible. Well, all this is going on with Joseph. A famine comes, and it's a terrible famine, and there's no food anywhere. But the word is out that there's some dude down in Egypt who'd been saving food for seven years. So Jacob gets his boys together, and he says, hey, I hear they got a lot of food down in Egypt, and they've, they've kind of saved it up, and you need to go down there and see if you can get some food, or we're going to starve. So Joseph's brothers come to Egypt, and they have no idea that Joseph is there or who he is or what he's doing, and they have no idea that they're going to meet their long-lost brother. Hmm. And when they get there, I have to tell you, I love this because Joseph has got to be, he's got to be my kind of man. He plays with his brothers. He plays with them. So Joseph's in this room. Now, you've got to get this picture and get it right. These brothers are in this room, and they have no idea that Joseph understands Hebrew. So they don't think Joseph understands what they're saying, so he's in the room, and here's the conversation they have when Joseph is listening, and they don't think he knows what they're saying. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, I told you, don't sin against the boy, and you wouldn't listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter, and he turned himself away from them and wept. Here's the details of what happened, the most poignant part of the story. Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? And his brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. Listen to this because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve your life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years which will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to Some say that the greatest question in life is, does God exist? I say the greatest question is, do I know the God who does exist? Do I know about him? Do I know him personally? The study of God as he reveals himself in scripture is the supreme study of a lifetime. It lifts our thoughts steadies our nerves, purifies our motives, expands our confidence, and strengthens our influence. It's the greatest subject we could ever study, for God is the apex of all reality. Discover more about God than you know, and become closer to Him than you are.
now, here is your host, Dr. David Jeremiah. God created the universe, the world, and each of us with distinct purposes in mind. His plans were established from before the foundation of the world. His intentions and decrees don't evolve with more knowledge, for He is all-knowing. He doesn't second-guess Himself like we do. The fact that God is changeless is a source of profound security for you and me, because it's the opposite of how we live. We can take hope in knowing that when we are afflicted, overwhelmed, and encircled by our enemies, we can turn our eyes to Him, who is always the same. In today's message titled, Knowing a Changeless God, I will share with you how God's promises, purposes, and provisions cannot and will not ever change. So stay tuned for today's edition of Turning Point. Our planet is facing an onslaught of global threats. But there's one menace that you and I face every day and we probably don't even know it. We feel it, but it's hard to grasp all of its implications. Experts call it ROC, Rate of Change. That's an appropriate acronym because it's not just the change, but it's the rate of change that's rocking our world. We're in a world that changes every single moment and we can't seem to keep up. Yet the consequences of not keeping up are very frightening. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for the right changes at the right times. In fact, the greatest change we'll ever experience in this world in which we live is the change we experience when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. He forgives us. He pardons us. He gives us eternal life. And the Bible says when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, He comes into our life and we are different people old things pass away and all things become new. You talk about change. When we come to Christ, we are redeemed from the inside out. We're made new in light of the Word of God. We literally pass from death to life when we are born again. The Bible says when Jesus comes again, we shall all be changed. One mortal moment and then an immortal eternity. 1 Corinthians 15 says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we shall be changed. And we're going to be changed to be like Christ. We're going to get a body like his resurrection body. Change is at the very heart of redemption. And that's very encouraging because if you're like me, you've noticed you could use a little change in here and there. Amen? Amen. Even in human civilization, many of our changes are good. I mean, who wants to go back to the days before indoor plumbing? Do we need to vote on that one? (laughs) We all love the benefits of electricity and medical advances and instant communications with people that we love. But some change is not good. Some change is for the worse. In the midst of all of this change, enter God. Unchanging, unchangeable, immutable, forever and unalterably stead fast. Our God never changes. So in light of that, that we have this unchanging God, I would like to give you five things that this means to us and how it affects our lives today. Yes, God is unchanging. What does it mean? First of all, it means that his promises are unchangeable. The terms unchangeable and immutable are hard to grasp. You've probably heard the word immutability. Maybe you wonder what in the world that is. Well, I'll help you understand that word and you'll never forget what it means. If you've studied science at all, you've heard about mutations. Mutations are changes. Immutability means no change. It's changes with the immu on the front of it, so there's no change. The word immutability is about change and the Bible says God does not do that. He does not change. The promises of the Bible are just as sure as the character of God. Because God does not change, His promises do not change. I remember when I was growing up, we had this little tradition in my house. I don't know if this was my mom or my dad, but I rather suspect it was my mom. She brought home one day what she called the promise box, and stacked together in this box were promises. 
And she put this on the kitchen table. And every time us kids would get ready to come to dinner, we would sit down for the prayer. And before we would pray, she would get this box out and she'd hand out one of these to everybody around the table. And we would read a promise from God before we prayed. And then we'd gather them all up and put them at the back of the box so they didn't circulate too quickly and we'd go through that box. And over the years that I grew up, one of my memories was constantly being exposed to the promises of God. And here are some of the cards from our kitchen table. I'd like you to help me remember them. Maybe some of them are what you need for today. So as I put them up on the screen, let's read them out loud together. Shall we do that? Let's go. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To grow stronger in our faith, we must focus our mental energy on the unfailing promises of God, on the unchangeable God who is behind those promises. There was a man who owned a company, and he was a Christian man, and he had a young laborer who worked for him who was also a Christian. And this owner began to notice that this young man who was a Christian was handling life a whole lot better than he was. They went through some trouble and some difficulty, and it was tearing apart the owner, but the young man who came to work just came every day with a smile on his face and never seemed to be moved at all by what was happening. And one day, the owner couldn't take it any longer, and he went to his young employee, and he said, what is it with you, sir? He said, you don't seem to be bothered by anything. He said, well, the secret is the promises of God. He said, well, I have them too. I stand on the promises of God. He said, that's your problem. He said, you can't stand on them. You've got to lay down on them and hold on to them with both hands and, and embrace them. He said, if you stand on them, the wind can blow you off of them. But if you hang on with both hands and you hug it with all your, you've got to hug your promises, he said. And that's not a bad truth. It's not just read it once and say, well, there it is. And take that promise to heart. Put your arms around it. Hug it to your soul. And God will meet your need. His promises are unchangeable. His purposes are unchangeable. That's the second thing. Not only are God's promises unchanging, so are his purposes. Did you know that when God created you, he already knew what you were going to be like because he saw you before the foundation of the world, and his purpose for you was already in his mind. There's no one here that doesn't have a purpose from God. You may not feel very purposeful. You may not feel very close to God. But if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Christ, Almighty God has a purpose for your life. And it's your, your responsibility to find out what that is. He's not going to send you an email. You, you have to get that. You have to get in the Word of God and find out what God is up to in your life. It's part of the growth that you go through. As humans, we have a hard time understanding this because let me tell you what we are. We're not immutable. We're improvisers. We improvise. I mean, we start cooking supper, and we don't have only the ingredients, and so we improvise. How's that turn out? We create a business plan, but we forget there's some obstacles out there that we didn't see, so we improvise. We form a game plan for our team, but the opponents call an audible and run a trick play, so we improvise. But God never improvises. He already knows all the contingencies, and his providence marches toward his goals and his immutable decrees. Perhaps you're saying, well, I've read the Bible, Dr. Jeremiah, and I've read some verses, and i got some questions. If you ever hang around young people, especially college-age kids, they know where all these places are. Somebody told them. They didn't read it in their devotional time. They heard it from some ungodly professor in the school they go to. But here are some of the things that you hear when you talk about the changeless nature of God. Does not the Bible tell us that God changes his mind? For instance, 
when God saw the wickedness of the world before the flood, he was sorry that he had made man on the earth. Or this one is the one we're going to talk about. The prophet Jonah delivered his message to the people of Nineveh. Here was his message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And yet when you read Jonah chapter 3, God spared Nineveh. What do you say when people say to you, well, God told the people of Nineveh that he was going to destroy them, and then we found out that he didn't do that. Did God change his mind? And I answer it like this. God's threat to wicked Nineveh was not unqualified and unconditional. God did not go to the king on the throne of Nineveh hearing Jonah's message and the parliament as it meant to discuss what might happen and the women as they wept at the well and the beggars as they wondered what to do. He did not go to them and say, it doesn't matter how you change your ways, you repent deeply or cry for mercy and destroy your idols and trust in me, I am still going to nuke you. God did not say that. If God had treated them after their repentance in the same way as he was going to treat them in their cruelty and contempt, then God would have been an implacable and unjust God. I mean, why had he bothered to go to such lengths to get Jonah by hook or by crook, by storm or by whale, to come and preach to them if he intended just to destroy them? Why not simply kill the lot of them? The unchangeable nature of God means that God is always consistent that he is always the same, that whatever happens in life, it is not God who is on the changing end of it, it is man. It is like the sun that hardens clay and melts butter. Is it the sun's fault that that happens? No, it's the character and quality of the object. He is changeless. He is always the same. He will always do the right thing. That is the consistency of the God that we serve. And then his provisions are unchangeable. And I like this one best of all because I have needs like you do. And uh, we like to know that we have a God up there who cares about all that. Here's what the Bible says in James 1:17: Every good endowment that we possess and every complete gift that we have received comes from above, from the Father of all lights with whom there is never the slightest variation or shadow of inconsistency. God is unchangeable, and his grace never diminishes. From his hand comes one blessing after another. Are we blessed or are we blessed? The same God who provided a spring of water for Hagar, created streams in the desert for the Israelites, brought bread by ravens for Elijah, delivered fish on the Galilean hillside, and food for the widows in the book of Acts. He's the God who will provide for you. He's the Father of lights, the maker of stars. He knows how to meet our needs, and he always is faithful when we trust him. And here's the good news, men and women. The same God who provided for the heroes of the Bible is caring for you. I love to think that the God who hears my cries for help is the same God who heard Daniel and David and Peter and Paul and all the rest of the people that I love to study in my Bible the same God. His promises are unchangeable. His purposes are unchangeable. His provisions are unchangeable, and his personality is unchangeable. Let me just say this right up front. This is one of my favorite things about this point. God is never in a bad mood. Do you know anybody like that? You're not married to one. I know that for sure. <laughs> God never has a bad day. There's never a place where you need to stop and say, well, let's wait until next week. Maybe God will be doing better by then. <laughs> Our Lord possesses the same... Some say that the greatest question in life is, does God exist? I say the greatest question is, do I know the God who does exist? Do I know about him? Do I know him personally? The study of God as he reveals himself in scripture is the supreme study of a lifetime. It lifts our thoughts, steadies our nerves, 
purifies our motives, expands our confidence, and strengthens our influence. It's the greatest subject we could ever study. For God is the apex of all reality. Discover more about God than you know and become closer to Him than you are. And now, here is your host, Dr. David Jeremiah. Faithfulness isn't simply quaint morality or an old-fashioned virtue. It's the core of integrity, sincerity, dependability, and trustworthiness. It's the glue that holds our culture together. Without it, relationships cannot survive and society cannot function. Faithfulness is also fundamental to the person of God. Without the faithfulness of God, the universe would be erratic and unpredictable. The planets would wobble in their orbits. The laws of nature would be unreliable and the sun would shine as it wished. Without the steadiness of God, there would be no order in the universe. The Bible says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Today, I will share essential ways knowing God's faithfulness will empower you each and every day. Jim and Carol Simbola are good friends of ours. Don and I have known them for many years, and almost every year we go to New York City to speak at the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Some of you remember when I was sick, Jim took off a Sunday from his great church in New York and came here and spoke at this church in my absence. Jim and Carol know something about the faithfulness of God. They prayed and praised and preached their way through a personal two-year nightmare Their teenage daughter, Chrissy, had gotten involved with some unhealthy influences and turned her back on the God they loved and served so faithfully. Although their hearts were breaking, they continued ministering to the people of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. During that time, Carol wrote a song that has become one of my favorite songs, and I've heard it many times. Some people think that she wrote her song, He's Been Faithful, after her daughter returned but she didn't. She wrote it before she returned, and she wrote it as she was laying in a hospital bed recovering from surgery to remove cancer from her body. The chorus goes like this. He's been faithful, faithful to me. Looking back, his loving mercy I see. Though in my heart I have questioned, even failed to believe, he's been faithful faithful to me. Carol refers to that time in her life and says that song was a song of hope born in the midst of pain. While hurting deeply, she said that her song became like a bomb to her heart, strengthening her once again. And the words she wrote during that time helped her move forward. Although her daughter had not yet come back to the Lord, she could still praise him for his loving faithfulness in her own life. And later when Chrissy showed up at home and fell to her knees begging forgiveness, the truth of Psalm 119, verse 90, became real to Carol. God is faithful not just to our generation, but to all generations. Carol experienced in a new way a line of her own song that has blessed so many people. What I thought was impossible, I've seen my God do. Faithfulness isn't just a quaint morality or an old-fashioned virtue. It's the core of integrity. It's the glue that holds our culture together. Without 
faithfulness, relationships can't survive and society can't function. It is essential to life on this earth. In other words, without the faithfulness of God, for example, the universe would be erratic and unpredictable. The planets would wobble in their orbits and the laws of nature would be unreliable and the sun would shine when it felt like it and when it didn't, it wouldn't. Without the faithfulness of God, there would be no stability in the universe at all. Did you know the Bible says in Colossians 1.17 that through Jesus Christ, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. The faithfulness of God is the glue that holds this world together. If God should for one moment withdraw his hand from this earth, it would fly into chaos and be forever gone. Psalm 89, too, actually says that God's faithfulness is established in the very heavens. And in Genesis, we have one of the great promises that to me is the great illustration of the faithfulness of God. God promised after the flood, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. You know what? Since he made that promise, We've had seed time and harvest every year, cold and heat every day, winter and summer every year, and day and night, never once has it failed. Behind the stability of nature is the consistency of God, and it's a source of great thanksgiving for all of us. In the hymn that's written about the faithfulness of God, there's a verse that goes like this, summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. I came here to tell you that our God can be trusted, always trusted, eternally trusted. He never forgets. He never falters. He never fails. He always keeps his word, and there is no possibility that he will ever change. The Bible says that faithfulness is the very clothing that God wears. Isaiah eleven five, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. When you stop and think about it, it's interesting why so many people are unfaithful these days. In my research for this message, I came up with all kinds of statistics about the unfaithfulness in marriage and all of that, but it's depressing, and I didn't want to tell you about it. It's just not good. Some people today are unfaithful because they're just too lazy, too lazy to do what they promised to do. Some people are unfaithful because their resolve gives out, and they don't have the stamina for the long haul. Sometimes their unfaithfulness is the result of desire or fear or weakness or of the loss of interest or outside influence. But none of these things, none of these things affect God. In the Old Testament scriptures, we read these words, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Psalm 119, verse 90 says, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. No wonder the prophet Jeremiah wrote, His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Did you know that the Hebrew word for faithfulness that Jeremiah uses in this text is the word aman? Yeah, it's the word from which we get the word amen. It is a word which means, so be it. So when you say amen in church to what I'm preaching on, you're just saying, so be it, pastor, so be it. God is the amen of every one of his promises. In fact, there's an interesting verse in 2 Corinthians that says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. God's faithfulness stands at the very center of his creation and it resides in the core of his revelation, the scripture, because faithfulness means keeping one's word. There's a great line about this in Joshua's farewell speech to his people. He gave this speech just before he was to die. It's in the 23rd chapter of the book that has his name on the front of it. And here's what he said. Listen to these words. Behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. 
And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass. Not one word of them has failed. The faithfulness of God is his determination to do what he has said, to always do what he says without variance. The Bible says, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, he is the faithful God. I woke up this morning thinking how blessed I am to come here and brag on the faithfulness of God. He's a faithful God. But let's bring this down to California and New York and Florida, to your house and to my house. Let's bring this teaching down to earth because I want you to see how it affects you. The attributes of God are great subjects to study but they are not abstract concepts. They have immediate, profound, life-changing effect on us right here and now. There is no subject in the law of God or in the libraries of men more relevant to you and to me today than the faithfulness of God. And I want to suggest five ways his faithfulness affects us. Number one, God's faithfulness precludes worry. Could I ask the question, got any worriers here today? Don't raise your hand. You'll worry about raising your hand all the rest of the day. So don't raise your hand. But we all have a tendency to worry, don't we? And it's more so now perhaps than ever before because there's so many more things to worry about than we've ever had. But God's faithfulness allows us to have total confidence in every promise he has written. It frees us from the grip of anxious worry. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 23, he who promised is faithful. In other words, he's going to keep his promise. All his promises, which cover every moment of our lives, are as certain as his character. The Bible speaks of Jesus as the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. And his resurrection is the sign and seal of God's power to guarantee to us his word. He said he would come back from the grave, and what did he do? He came back from the dead. And the Bible ends with ringing declaration. It says in Revelation 22, verse 6, these words are faithful and true. It's almost as if a a postscript to the Bible. Looking back over all the pages, one of the last verses in the Scripture says, you can count on it, friends, these words are faithful and true. Many years ago, there was a Bible scholar in London who developed an incredible interest in the subject of the promises of God in the Bible. So he went through the Scripture, and he listed his favorite promises, and there were a lot of them. He copied them into a manuscript and put some commentary along with them in application, and he sent them all to a publisher. And when his book came out, it was simply titled, The Promises of God. Well, time went on, and other books came along, and the market changed, and one day this man's book went through its last edition. It was no longer reprinted. Copies were hard to find. Sometime later, there was an elderly woman in England who remembered the book, and she decided she wanted a copy. So she wrote the publisher saying, I'm looking for a copy of the book, The Promises of God. Do you have any in stock? And the publisher wrote back a brief reply. I'm sorry, he said, but the promises of God are out of print. (laughs) Aren't you glad the promises of God are not out of print? I have a copy right here. (laughs) They will never be out of print. They will never be out of date. They will never be out of reach. They are as enduring as his inspired word. They're as trustworthy as his unchanging nature. The writer of the book of Psalms put it this way, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. There's a promise in the Bible for every situation you will ever face. And none of God's promises will ever fail, not even the slightest jot or tittle. That dispels worry, gives you a basis for freeing yourself from the grip of anxiety. In his book on prayer, one of my favorite writers, Philip Yancey, tells the story of Helmut Thielicke, a great German preacher of the last century who lived a life that, well, sounds like the life of Job, if you want to know the truth. Thielicke lost a university position because he opposed Hitler. 
He endured humiliating interrogations by the SS. He faced the constant threat of imprisonment. As the war growled to a close, he walked to his Stuttgart church one day, only to find it bombed to rubble, and he returned home to find his house totally destroyed. His heart nearly broke when he came across his famished children licking the pictures of food in recipe books. And each week he would stand in a pulpit that was made for this particular situation and try to bring a message of hope to his demoralized congregation. During the midst of all of this, he wrote these words. The one fixed pole in all the bewildering confusion is the faithfulness and dependability of God. He went on to say, one day, perhaps when we look back from God's throne, on the last day we shall say with amazement and surprise, if I had ever dreamed that God was only carrying out his design and plan through all these woes, I would have been more calm and confident. I would have been more cheerful and far more tranquil and composed. When you can step back from it all, no matter how intense it gets, and look up and know the God who created this universe the God who causes the sun to come up every day and to go down at night and the seasons to come and go and the heat and the cold and all the other things he promised of which we can now look and say they've never failed. He's the God who's in control of your life and in control of mine. I'll never forget a funeral we had at this church some years ago when a terrible tragedy had happened here. And the husband of the woman who died stood on this platform and said this, People ask me all the time now during these days, how are you handling this? How do you manage this? And he just said, I trust God. I trust God. God's faithfulness precludes worry. God's faithfulness promises answers. Because God is faithful, we have confidence when we pray. Through prayer, we can touch him immediately. Psalm 143, 1 says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. How can I know that God hears my prayers? Because it's the nature of God to be faithful, to be constant and consistent, and to come to our relief. Jeremiah says it this way, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Jason Meyer was taking studies in the doctoral program, and he was working very hard, not getting much sleep. One day he was driving home very early, around 4.30 in the morning, and falling asleep at the wheel, and he tried everything to stay awake. He turned up the radio. He tried to sing real loud. He even slapped himself in the face. And the next thing he knew, he woke up in his driveway more than a little shaken because he had no idea how he got there. As he walked into the house, now eerily awake, he entered his bedroom and noticed the strangest thing. His wife was wide awake. She would normally be asleep, but instead she was sitting up in bed waiting for him. She said, hi, honey, how was your drive? Meyer said, it's funny you should ask. I really struggle to stay awake on the drive home. In fact, I don't know how I got here. Yeah, I figured, she said. What do you mean you figured? Well, she said, I I woke at 4.30 very suddenly and felt this intense prompting to pray. So I figured you must be struggling on the road since that's around the time you normally come home. So I prayed for you. Looking back on this event, Meyer concludes, I think I'm still alive today because my wife obeyed the Spirit's prompting to pray. I hope this story gives you a greater sense of what's at stake in prayer. Every time you awake to pray, don't go back to sleep. Whatever it is you're supposed to pray for, pray for it because God woke you up to pray and God woke her up to pray and heard her prayer. God's faithfulness protects us from evil. God is faithful in keeping us from evil and from the evil one. We often underestimate the spiritual danger that's all around us. Jesus told us to request protection. He said, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Until I began working on this message, I had never connected the attribute of God's faithfulness with my protection. And then I read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3. The Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. 
Paul wrote that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and it had an impact on me. The next morning after I read that, I, I heard myself saying, I don't know what's going to happen in my life today, but God's protecting me. God's got a hedge around me. He's guarding me. Let me ask you a question this morning. When you think of the faithfulness of God, what comes to your mind first? I bet if we could all be honest, we'd probably say, I think of how unfaithful I've been. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, aren't you glad that God's faithfulness to you is not conditioned upon your faithfulness to him? Oh, my goodness. That, that sends horror through your mind, doesn't it? But the Bible says it is God who is faithful. He cannot be unfaithful to us because we're unfaithful to him because he is never unfaithful. So even when we fail, even when we look back and we, we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, it's me again, it's the same thing we talked about yesterday. <laughs> he never stops being faithful to us. If you're a Jesus follower and you feel defeated by your failures, join the club. <laughs> But let me remind you of something. God's faithfulness to you is not conditioned by your faithfulness to him. He is faithful to you no matter what. And then here's something all of us who love music resonate with. God's faithfulness promotes praise. The writer of Psalm 89 said it this way, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. Because God is faithful, we can't help but praise him. We want to praise him. We hear a message like this, we read scriptures like this, and we want to stand up with our hands up high and say, Lord, thank you for being so faithful to me. Psalm 71, 22 says, With the lute I will praise you and your faithfulness, O my God. To you I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. Let me tell you what I know. Until we praise God, we have not truly enjoyed God. Until we learn how to worship God, we are leaving a lot of the blessings of God on the table. If you know how faithful he is, my friend, you cannot help but praise him. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Isn't it interesting that we declare his loving kindness in the morning and then we go through the day, and when we get through the day, we look back and we declare his faithfulness because his loving kindness was faithful all day long. God's faithfulness precludes worry. His faithfulness promises answers. His faithfulness protects us from evil. And his faithfulness promotes praise. But there's one more. God's faithfulness provides encouragement. The reality of God's faithfulness kept the prophet Jeremiah from collapsing in despair. I've never truly understood Jeremiah, nor how he survived, because when the Lord called him to preach, he told him in the calling that nobody was going to listen to him. I think I would have quit the first day. <laughs> Jeremiah, I want you to go and talk to these people, but they're not ever going to listen to you. Can you imagine? Jeremiah witnessed the collapsing of everything around him. He wrote two books in the Bible, the book that bears his name and a shorter book that follows that like a postscript, the book of Lamentations. And the book of Lamentations is the saddest book in the Bible. The word lamentation means to lament, to mourn deeply, to be swallowed up in grief. Because of lamentations, we sometimes call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. People have called me that because of my last name. Jeremiah had a reason for his laments. He served the Lord during the final tragic days of Judah and Jerusalem. Every king during that time was worse than the one before, and the godlessness of the age accelerated like a runaway train despite Jeremiah's earnest preaching and pleading. Nobody listened to him. He was persecuted and abused and threatened with death. He was beaten and thrown into a miry pit. 
And when the Babylonians laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, Jeremiah faced a prolonged nightmare of food and water deprivation and thousands of people starving and disease rampant everywhere. And as he watched, the Babylonians breached the walls of the city and massacred the citizens and imprisoned the nobles and destroyed the city and burned the temple of the Lord to the ground. And according to tradition, somehow Jeremiah survived all of that And he went to the Mount of Olives and sat there looking over the city in traumatized condition, in rags, and watched the city burn. And if you read the book of Lamentations, it opens with these words. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow is she who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers, and she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. The Babylonian invasion and the exile of the survivors of Judah didn't simply represent the fall of a great nation. It seemed to call into question God's entire plan for humanity. The Lord had promised Abraham a great nation, on a designated stretch of land and out of that nation would come a Messiah who would solve all of the earth's problems and reign supreme from Jerusalem. And now there was no more Jerusalem. David's throne was toppled and all hope seemed gone. Jeremiah was in anguish. He said, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by me? Behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted in the day of his fierce anger. For these things I weep, my eye, my eye overflows with water. Zion spreads out her hands and no one comforts her. To Jeremiah, God's judgment did not simply fall on Jerusalem and Judah. It fell on him. He personalized the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time throughout the day. God has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out and he has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. The more he wrote in the book of Lamentations, the more agitated he got as he saw the world around him crumble. He said, he has broken my teeth with gravel. He has covered me with ashes. Lord, you have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord but not quite. One thought breaks out like a bolt of lightning in a dark sky. There is one attribute of God that falls like the morning dew on Jeremiah's tortured brow. He writes, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That great song that we sing didn't come on a mountaintop experience when all was well. It came in the midst of the darkest night of Jeremiah's soul. And when you read Lamentations 3, you wonder if there are some missing verses. Because what happens is all of a sudden you get to verse 21. Jeremiah seems to switch from pain to praise on a dime. Did someone find this manuscript and cut out some verses? No, I don't think that's what happened. Jeremiah did what every believer must do if we're going to encourage ourselves in times of difficulty. We stop listening to ourselves and we start talking to ourselves. This I recall, he said. This I recall to my mind. We have to learn, even in the midst of life's most painful situations, to bring something to mind. We have to remind ourselves of God's unchanging, overarching, undergirding faithfulness. We have to remember God's continual compassions, which are new every morning. 
Now, I love this hymn based on this passage, Great is Thy Faithfulness, but the author of the hymn, Thomas Chisholm, made one slight mistake. The hymn says, morning by morning, new mercies I see. But that's not what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah did not see any visible morning mercies when he wrote Lamentations 3. At that moment, he had no visible evidence of God's mercy at all. Morning by morning brought nothing but horror and pain and dread. But Jeremiah said, in effect, even if I don't see any tangible blessings right now, that does not alter God's mercy, God's compassion, God's faithfulness. Whether I can see them or not, God's mercy is continual. He is my portion. Therefore, I hope in him. My friend, if the only time we declare the faithfulness of God is when we feel everything is in order in our lives, we may not say it very often. God is not faithful because we understand what he's doing. God is not faithful because our day started off well. God is faithful because he is God, and it is his nature to be faithful. God's providence and God's faithfulness are like reading Hebrew. When I went to seminary, I had to learn how to read Hebrew. The first thing I discovered was none of the letters were like anything I had ever seen. And the second thing, which was most difficult for me, was to learn that Hebrew reads from the right to the left and not from the left to the right, from the back to the front and not from the front to the back. The providence of God is like reading Hebrew. You have to read it backwards. You have to. Some say that the greatest question in life is, does God exist? I say the greatest question is, do I know the God who does exist? Do I know about him? Do I know him personally? The study of God as he reveals himself in scripture is the supreme study of a lifetime. It lifts our thoughts, steadies our nerves, purifies our motives, expands our confidence, and strengthens our influence. It's the greatest subject we could ever study, for God is the apex of all reality. Discover more about God than you know, and become closer to Him than you are. And now, here is your host, Dr. David Jeremiah. God could have easily created the earth devoid of the vast and distinct beauty we observe in the mountains, in the valleys, and in the sea. What if our landscape was always the same, bleak, unchanging, desolate, but God packed the world with seemingly limitless panoramas of beauty? Why? Because he is so good. And because God is good, we can wake up every morning, look out at the beautiful new day God has made, and declare, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In today's message, which I call Knowing a Good God, we're going to look at four ways God's goodness is revealed to us. The actual evidence that God is good. So stay tuned for today's edition of Turning Point. Our world has a hard time distinguishing between good and bad. Our cultural values are changing so quickly that virtues once prized 
are now scorned and behavior once condemned is now celebrated. The prophet Isaiah anticipated this when he wrote, Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Even non-religious people instinctively know there is a moral standard somewhere in the universe, and that good and bad are objective realities. Even amid shifting morals and manners, we want to be good people, better people. In fact, over the last two years, the Marist poll that chronicles our New Year's resolution reports that being a better person has now topped the perennial favorite of losing weight. Everybody wants to be a better person even more than they want to lose weight. But goodness is so much more than the secular writers can convey. Goodness is an attribute of God himself. And until we see goodness as God is good, we really don't understand it at all. Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness. First Chronicles 16, 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When I say God is good, I mean he is gracious. I mean he is merciful. When I say that God is good, I'm talking about his perfection and his excellence. But the more I studied this word in the Bible, the more one central concept seems to jump out at me. It seems to me that God's goodness is conveyed mostly in his generosity. Perhaps God's quality of goodness means far more than his generosity, but it certainly includes his infinitely generous attitude toward you and me. As we consider his goodness, here is how it affects us. Here are some derivatives from the goodness of God for us to use in our lives every day. First of all, God is good. He provides for us. We experience God's generous goodness by the way he takes care of us. The psalmist said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm here to tell you today that no matter what the circumstances look like, behind all of the mist of the unknown is this truth. We have a God who is good. It's remarkable to think about that, but when we're in the will of God through Jesus Christ, we will never face a genuine need for which God doesn't give us a genuine provision. Think about this. The one who gave us lungs created air. The one who gave us stomachs supplies food and water. He who made us in his image provided companionship. And he who made us with eyes created spellbinding vistas for us to enjoy. He who made us with eternal souls provided a pathway to heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever our need, the goodness of God provides the answer. Psalm 33, 5 says, The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. At the beginning of this message, I quoted Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. And we tend to interpret that verse metaphorically and spiritually, but there's a literal truth to this. Sometimes we need to taste something desirable and say, this is from God and this is good. Sometimes we need to behold a gorgeous vista and remember God is good. Sometimes we need to smell a pleasing aroma and remember that God is good. He gave us five senses, and his provisions come to us through all five of those senses to remind us of his goodness. God is good. He provides for us. Can we say an amen to that? Is God our provider? Amen. Number two, God is good, and he's patient with us. We see God's goodness and generosity in his incredible patience with us. In fact, in the Bible, the idea of God's patience is frequently linked to the idea of his goodness. Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5 says, Be thankful to him and bless